All right. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, just after 8 a.m. Uh, I believe it's June 23rd. Yes, it's, it's actually right there on the screen. Uh, we are at the Energy for All Alaska Task Force meeting. And the subject for today is CARES Act funding. Uh, the CARES Act funding that came down from the federal government to and through the state was distributed to local municipalities uh, and has now been acted upon by uh, it could, to completion by two of the three municipal entities. And I also have information regarding the third, which would be the city of North Pole. I believe that their acceptance of funds ordinance uh, is up for reconsideration this evening. Uh, but again, recognizing that the, uh, there are funds to be made available to and through the community, uh, wanted to let the municipal uh, leaders give us a, a briefing on their plans for that distribution. So if I may, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Mayor Ward to begin. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Stewart. And thank you everyone for uh, being online today. Uh, I have a short presentation to go over the FNSB CARES Act funding that we've received and the appropriation ordinance that uh, was approved last Thursday. Uh, so the ordinance, appropri the ordinance appropriated the funding. Uh, we actually have those pots set up and are on our way um, to being able to get those distributed. So I'll start off here. Uh, as part of the work that we've been doing uh, with the uh, Fairbanks North Star Borough, uh, we've been using uh, our Economic Development Commission as part of uh, our efforts in the recovery. Uh, the Economic Development Commission has put together a recovery plan, and uh, there's a short video which goes over um, just some kind of inspirational shots, if you will, from the uh, during the, the stay-at-home orders uh, and, and really sets a stage for recovery. Uh, there's a lot of plan, uh, a lot of uh, tasks outlined in that plan um, on how to uh, be able to leverage both uh, the CARES Act funding and then additional resources within the community. So I encourage you to check that out if you haven't if you haven't looked at that already. That's available on the borough's website, fnsb.us. So to review the CARES Act funding um, that the Fairbanks North Star Borough Relief, uh, the Fairbanks North Star Borough has received. Uh, it was signed into law in March on March 27th. Uh, this, there's over 150 billion dollars that was sent to states, tribal entities. Uh, and local governments. The Alaska legislature approved roughly $24.5 million of the state's $1.25 billion um, to be passed through to the Fairbanks North Star Borough. This does not include the cities of North Pole and Fairbanks. Uh, we have um, allocated a portion of that for direct expenses as related to um, borough, uh, borough functions, costs that we've incurred due to the pandemic. And the remaining funds, which is about 18 and a half million, uh, are to be used to provide assistance to local businesses, nonprofits, and healthcare organizations that have incurred costs or suffered revenue losses due to COVID-19. We have established three programs, the Business Interruption Grant, a PPE grant, and a Healthcare Interruption Grant. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but roughly 6.1, uh, 6.2 million was, are, is set aside for borough response funding. Uh, this is uh, not only intended just to cover the borough uh, direct expenses, but uh, some of the school district expenses as well. Uh, we've got a list of, of expenditures that we're totaling uh, to help get the school district facilities uh, up and running and ready for the upcoming school year. Uh, eligible expenditures must be incurred uh, from the beginning of the pandemic through December 30th, 2020. And set asides uh, that we're looking at are, are to cover potential future expenses for deep cleaning, teleworking, PPE, and additional protective measures. Part of the challenge that we faced with um, the allocation for the borough and the school district is we don't really know what this fall is going to hold. So um, it's hoped that we have more than we need in this bucket. Uh, the way that the assembly appropriated the funding, we have the appropriations of the total 24 and a half, roughly million dollars, and then we have allocations to the different pots. And so what that does is it gives us the ability, if we have a program that is performing really well or one that's not performing very well, uh, we can actually move funding between those pots to make sure we're, we're leveraging it to the, to the greatest potential for the community and what the actual needs are. The first program that we have, uh, which has the most amount of money, is the Business Interruption Grant. 
uh, it totals after the assembly amended this 11 million. Uh, eligible businesses are able to receive up to $15,000 uh, as part of uh, this program, to be an eligible applicant, you have to have 50 um, or 50 full-time equivalent or fewer employees. I have been substantially in fact affected by uh, a local mandate voluntary closure to promote social distancing due to staffing shortages um, or decreased customer demand. Uh, had, have had annual revenues not to exceed $5 million and had at least a 25% loss in revenue or 25% increase in expenditures uh, due to COVID-19. You have to be physically located within the borough and engaged in business before March 1st, 2020. And be in good standing with the state of Alaska Division of Corporations business licenses. The Mr. next- Mr. Mayor? Program, yes, uh, Joe. Could we go back a slide? May I ask regarding the $5 million cap on annual revenues, would mm -hmm. that be a net gross and what was the logic behind that number? Uh, we looked at other programs that communities have used um, and looked at what uh, if, if businesses that have excess of $5 million in uh, annual revenues uh, and it's, it's gross revenues uh, have access to additional other programs, whether it be through the state of Alaska or through the federal government. So really a lot of the programs that we have here with the exception of the healthcare interruption grant are really targeted towards the smaller businesses, the more, you know, essentially mom and pops. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Okay. Uh, the next program that we have is the PPE or personal protection equipment grant. It totals, the total pot is up to 1.5 million uh, and businesses are eligible up to $1,500 for reimbursable expenses due to PPE costs that they've incurred. So it's for PPE to provide masks or um, additional um, cleaning measures for, uh, for staff or for your patrons. Again, you have to be physically located within the Fairbanks North Star Borough and be engaged in business before March 1st, 2020. But this is, there's no cap on this one um, businesses are able to submit their receipts uh, for those expenses that they've incurred and then receive up to $1,500 um, paid back. Did you have any questions on, on this program? I did not. Uh, by the way, as usual, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to chime in or raise your hand. I am monitoring. Uh, hey, Mayor, this is uh, Representative Greyer Hopkins. Um, can you guys hear me all right? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming in and talking with us today. I know this has been of interest to a lot of people. Um, on the uh, the PPE grant, is, is that something that you'd heard from the community that uh, they needed to cover expenses for cleaning and, and PPE devices? Um, was that a need that, that you had felt out there? Yeah, it's, it's definitely one that um, we've heard from a number of folks. I've heard from a number of folks that they, that are additional costs that they're, incur, they're incurring. Um, there is no, unlike the business interruption grant, there is no requirement that a business have suffered losses. It's just an, it's just an increased expense. Um, and we recognize that cleaning measures and safety measures, providing masks, et cetera, um, definitely help for the health of the community. So that was some of the methodology that we used is um, for this program. We originally had two and a half million dollars in this pot. Uh, the assembly did reduce this amount uh, and put more money into the healthcare interruption grant and the business interruption grant. So um, ultimately we've settled on um, at, at uh, 1.5 million with $1,500 per eligible business it allows us to do a thousand grants um, at $1,500 a piece. Great, thank you. Seeing the uh, the masks and the plexiglass screens around town uh, certainly is an additional cost, and I think it has definitely helped. So I agree with you on that, and thank you for moving this forward. Thank you. All right, I'll move on to the next program. Our third program is the Healthcare Impact Grant. Uh, the assembly moves some money around. We've got seven million in this pot now. Uh, the amount per eligible applicant is, to, is going to be determined by the Health and Social Services Commission. Uh, they are responsible for uh, allocating the state's uh, pass-through grant funding. Uh, in, in normal years, we did uh, 
task that commission uh, with reviewing the applications, determining the eligibility uh, and, uh, and overall program uh, determinations for this. Uh, but essentially what the applicant must have uh, as part of the requirements set out by the assembly is that they must have annual revenues greater than 5 million, have at least 25% loss in revenue or increase in expenditures, be a healthcare business or nonprofit, be physically located within the borough and be engaged in business by March 1st of 2020. And so um, the idea is that we would have a set period of time uh, that uh, folks would be able to apply, that businesses would be able to apply in town uh, for this pot of funding and that the determination and allocation would be set by the Health and Social Services Commission, very much like they do now with the state pass through grant funding. Um, this is the pot that uh, the hospital would most likely be eligible for. Um, there is no cap on the amount that uh, would be allocated out with the exception of the total pot is only 7 million. Um, but uh, this, this is our, our intent at uh, being able to provide relief to the healthcare industry. And again, it's not limited to for-profit or not, it's not limited to not prefer profit businesses, um, but for-profit businesses are eligible for this as well. Uh, you just have to have had a loss in revenue or increase of a, in expenditures due to uh, of 25% due to COVID-19. Mr. Mayor, do we have a sense of the universe of eligible potential applicants under these parameters? Yeah, so we don't really have um, a solid number of, uh, of what we believe, but it's most likely going to be a handful. So um, a half dozen to a dozen potential applicants that would be eligible to apply, not necessarily saying that all of them may actually apply for this program. Uh, Mayor, this is Representative Hopkins. I, of course, have another question. Um, uh, with the no cap on, on how much they can get from the uh, Health Care Commission or Social Services Commission, is it expenditures on loss of revenue that they have to prove to get reimbursed, or are they able to come in and say, we lost a million and a half bucks and we want five million bucks in our grant, or do they have to, um, how, how does that does that payment structure work? Yeah, so the requirement that we have right now for eligibility is that they have to have had a 25% loss in revenue or 25% increase in expenditures. So they'll have to determine or show evidence uh, of, of that loss. Um, I, I guess it would be, I think, unlikely that the Health and Social Services Commission would award more than the loss would be. Uh, so if they had a million dollar loss, I, I think it would be unlikely, but you know, this is going to be up to the commission to determine um, what they would be eligible for. But I would assume it would be if there was a million dollars of loss, they wouldn't receive more than a million dollars as part of that uh, award. Okay, so that's up to the, the commission to sort of write their own regs, I guess, more or less. Okay. Yeah, and like I, I mentioned earlier, the, the commission has a, a great track record of being able to do this. Um, and, and honestly, they do, they, they have more requests every year than they have um, a, availability of resources um, and have some great methodology that they've, they've developed over the years, the commission has, uh, to be able to make those, those determinations for how that funding should be allocated. Again, it's a much smaller pot, uh, a little bit different in scope, but the principles, are, I think, are still the same. further questions? We can always circle back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Please proceed. All right. So we're uh, going to yes. work on... Um, Sorry. Uh, I was slow at the uh, mute button. Oh. Representative Lebon. Um, yes. uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for uh, joining us today. Uh, in, in factoring out uh, the recipients of the health care impact grant uh, funding, do you take into account or how do you take into account any mandates that uh, an example would be Foundation Health Partners uh, was placed upon them by the state to respond to the coronavirus uh, threat? And uh, do you compare the impact of a state mandate with a for profit or not for profit healthcare provider? Is that measured in any fashion or have you gotten that far in the process? Thank you for that question. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Representative Levon. So it's part, it's, it's our intent that the Health and Social Service Commission is gonna be the one to, to set those parameters and those weights. So when they look at things like the difference between a uh, not-for-profit or a for-profit um, entity, when they look at um, the services that that, um, that that operation provides to the community, those are things that are gonna get weighted into the decision of how much of the resources that we have um, are allocated to uh, that organization or not. So it, the intent is that the Health and Social Services Commission will be the one to make that um, those allocations based on um, parameters that they establish. But I, I would imagine that those things would be a, a big part of what they, they do. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna go through our application process as we envision things and kind of go um, over the next steps between now that we have the appropriation from the Fairbanks North Star Borough Assembly to how we actually get payments out to eligible applicants um, in, into the community. Uh, so we're gonna have an application process. We are working, uh, and in fact, our RFP went out, I think on Friday uh, to uh, select a third party vendor to help with processing the applications and then also for uh, marketing these programs to uh, businesses and entities within the Fairbanks North Star Borough. Um, that those th that third party consultant, once we um, select them, will be uh, accepting those and then providing the initial eligibility review of the applications, processing them. Those will come to uh, the Fairbanks North Star Borough for payment, and then we will be issuing the checks um, based on those, uh, the, the review of the applications by the third party consultant. That's for the business interruption grant and the PPE grant. Um, it's intended that those will, we're going to make those as streamlined as possible. As I mentioned, um, the intent is that our application process and all of our um, information is processed online. So we're, we're going to um, work with our, our consultant once that person is selected um, on how we intake those. But uh, again, like I said, everything we're, we're really looking for is to, to process them online and make them as simple as possible. The healthcare interruption grant. Um, is a little bit of a similar process. However, um, there will be a set period of time that we'll be taking applications. The consultant re will review and provide initial eligibility review of those applications and recommendation, or just not recommendation, but just um, provide them to the commission. And then the Health and Social Services Commission will review all of the applications and then determine the allocation uh, within the funding allowed for the healthcare's uh, interruption grant uh, to the different entities, and then we will process payment uh, and make payment to those uh, to those folks. We are meeting with the Health and Social Services Commission Chair uh, at the end of the month here, and the intent is um, as soon as we've got the third-party consultant online um, that we'll be able to start getting this program out and available um, for folks to apply. I mentioned earlier that uh, we're using, at least it's, we're proposing that we use a third party consultant um, to process the large number of applications that we're expecting to see. Uh, the RFP is out on the street right now. We're asking for someone that has experience with grant administration and management, marketing of, of programs to communities, um, and then also has the technical assistance to be able to understand uh, the different types of programs that are available out there. So. Uh, this this third party um, consultant will uh, the RFP is out for uh, 30 days. Uh, it's opened until July 20th, 2020. That gives us a few days to do our uh, review of the applications, make our determinations, and the intent is that we would be up and running um, with these programs as of August 1st. This is a proof of concept uh, example of what we're looking at um, for the CARES Act website, also for the application. Uh, there's a uh, survey tool um, that has actually been uh, very, very beneficial for several other um, applications that we've put it through um, here at the borough and using it as an application process, uh, I think is gonna be really beneficial. Folks will essentially have um, a, a drop down screen uh, to be able to select what type of program they're applying for and be able to provide their information, upload 
uh, supporting documentation, et cetera. Um, but this is, this is an example of what it will most likely look like. Uh, we are encouraging as soon as we get, um, we've got a little bit more work to do, but uh, when we get the website up and running, uh, is that we will be encouraging people to sign up for notifications so that we can notify individuals and uh, organizations when these programs are actually open for applications. And so um, that's going to be our big push here uh, in the next uh, next several weeks. So to go up uh, to go over the uh, the program here, we've got about eighteen and a half million dollars, which will be allocated to different. Uh, businesses and nonprofits throughout the community. Uh, the borough has created three programs, the Business Interruption Grant, the PPE Grant, the Healthcare Interruption Grant. Um, we're out, we have an RFP out on the street to secure contractors uh, to be able to process those applications and provide awareness and market, um, uh, market those, those programs to the community. Uh, the applications are anticipated to be opening in the next four to six weeks. And we're encouraging folks to sign up to the program uh, when it launches. The uh, the URL that we're going to be using is fnsb.us uh, forward slash uh, cares, and uh, this uh, QR code will work to to get you to that site. I don't think it's up and running yet, um, but if you if you type that in, I can find out here real quick. And Jomo, that uh, that wraps up my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions on the overall program or revisit a slide. Uh, if you would like. Uh, um, I guess if nobody else has any questions, this is of course Representative Cryer again with, with another question. Um, the business interruption grant, do you know if those dollars going out on the street have any of the same restrictions that um, the state small business association grant has for previous funds from the federal government. Um, wanted to make sure we don't have other issues uh, out on the, the those dollars that we don't know about. Yeah, great question. So um, as part of the CARES Act funding, you can't essentially double dip. So if I use an expense um, or I claim a loss um, for eligibility for one program, you can't claim that same loss or expense for another program. Um, our, our programs are designed to where they can stack on top of each other, um, but it requires that we do a little bit more legwork and that the applicant do a little bit more legwork to ensure that they're not um, applying for more than uh, their losses would be. And the example would be, I think, in, in your um, previous example with the healthcare interruption grant, if their loss was a million dollars, they'd be eligible for a million. But if they've received other funding um, to cover that loss, they wouldn't be able to they wouldn't have eligibility for that same amount of funding. So if they received 500,000 from the state of Alaska, they would only be eligible for 500,000 from the Fairbanks North Star Borough. Does that answer your question? I think we lost Cryer. <laughs> so the idea is that it, this, this program is not subject to the same limitations that the state program is. So if you have received federal funding, you may still be eligible for uh, the local funding as well. Maybe I'll jump in with a follow-up. This is Representative Lebon to Representative Hopkins' question. The um, uh, 51C6 uh, designated um, uh, organization, how are they treated uh, under the uh, big grant application process or have you um, uh, got that far as far as determining eligibility, Mr. Mayor? So nonprofits would be eligible for the business interruption grant, just the same as a for-profit business. And that would include 501c6 organizations such as Explore Fairbanks? I believe so, but I'll have to look into that. Thank you.
Mr. Stewart, do you have any other questions or thoughts, concerns on uh, the programs? Uh, no, I do not off the top of my head. Oh, and I, I see I've been talking into a muted mic. Uh, so you'll be able to stay with us for a few more minutes, Mr. Mayor? Certainly. I'm here for the whole hour. Very good. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, uh, let's move on to City of Fairbanks. And again, everybody, uh, Mayor Ward and the FNSB will still be online if we have follow-up questions at the end. Okay, so just one moment, sir. Okay. All right, I am going to pull up, let's see, City of Fairbanks. Okay, and if you give me one second. Okay. Okay. Mayor Matherly, uh, Chief of Staff, Mr. Meeks, can everybody see the presentation? Yes. All right, very good. Then I'll hand the uh, presentation over to you guys. Um, let me start by saying good morning, Jomo. This is Mayor Matherly. Sorry about my throat. I want to say good morning to the interior delegation, anybody listening, and visitors as we present to you our plans for our CARES funding. We have a committee that was head up by our chief financial officer, Margarita Bell. She's on the line along with Mike Meeks and myself. I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Bell for the presentation and talk about our committee and, and our, our funds and our application process. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us and Ms. Bell and Mr. Meeks. Uh, thank you, sir. And, and Miss Bell is here, but she keeps pointing at me, so I will do this. But she is the brainchild behind this. She just doesn't want to be on camera talking, but that's okay. Um, and and Jumbo, you're going to drive the slides for me, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Slide two overview. I will move out kind of quickly, so uh, you know, jump in if you have a question for us. The city was awarded sixteen million dollars, of which twelve million has come to us uh, as of, as of to date. Uh, Ms. Bell, uh, talking to the mayor, the mayor uh, established a five-member panel to sit down and discuss how we wanted to do this. That panel was made up of myself, Margarita Bell, Brenda Riley, uh, Jeremy yep. Politenkoff, and Mr. Mike Sanders, Housing and Homeless. So we had a well-rounded representation. That committee uh, reported back to the mayor, who then reported to the council for the funds allocation as follows. From the 16 million, the city is going to pull 1 million out uh, for admin and direct cost. But be advised, there's no way we're going to use that much money. And so, whatever we have left, we will probably most likely roll it back into one of the other buckets. The committee decided that 35% of that funding of the 15 million that was left over should go to healthcare facilities. We'll describe what those are in a minute. Another 35% should go to businesses and nonprofits with 30% going to individuals. Uh, slide three, Mr. Jomo, on concept. What we wanted to do with the businesses, organizations, uh, is anywhere from March 1st to 31 May 2020, uh, expenses that were directly impacted by, uh, that were directly impacted by COVID-19. We put RFPs out for third parties to assist us. We had two responses back from banks and two responses back from nonprofit organizations. We're in final negotiations with one bank and one nonprofit. The concept is that the bank would handle all the issues associated with businesses and nonprofits and our nonprofit in, uh, would be focusing on the individuals. Slide four, please. So that's uh, slide four basically shows what our direct cost will be. Uh, we have probably start a pool within the city. And I would bet you that the city administrative expenses is going to be less than 300,000, but that's still to be determined. Next slide five. 
The medical facilities at 35% comes in at approximately 5.25 million. We have already sent the applications out on, that went out on the 16th of June uh, to the three institutions that you see there, Fairbanks Memorial, Chief, Isaac, Chief Andrew Isaac Health Center, and the Interior Community Health Center. That's a, a, a misprint on the slide. Those, uh, those were directly uh, sent to them. They don't have to compete. And they were, uh, they were chosen because first of all, they're inside the city and they, uh, they provided uh, they, uh, direct costs for COVID testing. Our goal is to have those applications back by the end of June and have the money uh, out the door first week or so in July. Now, if you ask the question, what about all those other small medical facilities, dentist's office and things like that, we consider those a business. And so they would be applying under the business application uh, and not under medical facilities. Slide six, business organizations at another 35% is about a $5.25 million cut. Key here is that you have to have a valid business license for the city as of 30 April. We will go live is our goal right now, one July. We talked to our financial institution yesterday. They wanted some process flow charts. We have, have a rough draft of the process flow chart, how the individual will start it, move uh, to the banking institution, move to the city and then payment. We're trying to make sure the, uh, the process flow is as uh, easy as possible. There's a slide later on on online that we'll get to, but we're for businesses and those nonprofits, our goal is to have paperless. It will all be online is the goal that we have. Uh, so if the applications are truly ready to go on uh, uh, 1 July, they will go out and cost uh, the grant will, uh, for each of these business and nonprofit is up to 100,000. And if it's any expense whatsoever that hasn't been re re reimbursed, then it's eligible. So we chose to throw all expenses into one category. If you have, uh, if you were forced to close down and you need to help uh, and you incurred expenses on utilities or mortgage or rent, or uh, if you also had uh, expenses as you pertain to the PPE, it's all wrapped up in expenses and that falls all in the same category. And just as Mayor Ward said, no double tapping. If you've already got money for uh, uh, rent, if you got rent payments, you can't ask us to also give you rent payments uh, also. So that concept of no double tapping, I think is, is everywhere. If you go to slide seven on the individuals, this is probably going to be our most challenging area. And as such, the organization that we're working with is very concerned about uh, volume of uh, work that's gonna have to be done. So we're still working this out. Um, but the concept is that we don't want to go a direct payment to the individual. We wanna do direct payment either to a mortgage company, a landlord, a utility, anything like that. And we were interested on the utility. So I put a phone call in to Golden Heart and asked them, give me the months of May and June uh, can you tell me how much water sewer bills you collected just in the city residence? Their software program wasn't set up that easily to do it, but it uh, once we figured out that it wasn't going to be that hard. Uh, I, and so they came back and they said 1.9 million is the total amount of uh, bills that went out for those two months. Our next question was how many, how much is in arrears? And at that 1.9 million, 300,000 was in arrears. We think that the uh, 4.5 million we have with the individuals is going to come in. Uh, we're going to have a lot more in the pot. And the council approved the mayor being able to move between pots as we go through this. It's our belief that uh, the, the healthcare organization's money will go fast. We think the business organizations will be done by the end of July. We think the individuals are gonna be much more challenging, but uh, we're gonna shoot for a goal to get this done before the end of August if possible. Right now, the, uh, the contract says that uh, the, the individuals also would be done by the end of July. 
so, so that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, and I do believe I can mention who we are, who we're working with on individuals. I'm looking, she's shaking her head, yes. So it's Love Inc. that has stepped up to try to help us with this. Uh, and they have, uh, of course, some concerns on cost and just volume of work. So we're working with them and we hope to have that finished very shortly. If you take a look at page eight, uh, Till Soden has been working hard and this online uh, application process is, uh, is looking very good right now. We're gonna be sitting down with the uh, banking institution and uh, make sure they understand how this works. And we should be going live with this on 1 July. That is the general overview for the city of Fairbanks. Uh, we eagerly await your questions. All right, very good. Do we have any questions for Chief of Staff Meeks and the city team? If I, if I could jump in, this is Representative Lebon. Um, thanks for the presentation. And uh, uh, I guess my question is regarding the um, health care providers. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, three of them. The uh, allocation is there a formula within the formula on how that's going to be treated or do you know, have you gotten that far yet? Thank we're, you. We're going to, yeah, yes, sir. Thank you for the question. When they submit their expenses, uh, that's going to help us out a lot. If the expenses of the three exceed 5.25 million, then we're going to have to do some brainstorming. I'm pretty sure it's going to, uh, <laughs> but we don't know by how much right now. And we, we're going to try to do, we want to be as fair as possible, but we also know that some of the medical facilities are getting money, as you heard from uh, North Star Borough. So we're going to have to look at the totality of that picture uh, to make the decision. Thank you. Hey, Mike, this is Mindy O'Neill. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in on the assembly and in our economic development commission is how the borough and the city are working get together to disperse the funds. Um, so there's a uh, no double dipping or double tapping or whatever you're calling it. Um, can you talk to us about that? Sure. So, um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll share our information with the borough, but it's also on our application. You're signing a statement saying that you haven't got this money anywhere else. So if, anyone chooses to lie on that statement, uh, they're signing a statement saying that they have not received funds from any other source. And if that's not true and they're caught, then there will be circumstances later on down the line for that. Can you talk to us about how that will be enforced through your process? Well, we think we're gonna get hit with a pretty good audit. And if the audit starts tracing down to the individuals and they said, look, this business ABC, uh, applied for 100,000 from you for these expenses, and they also applied 100,000 to the uh, the borough, and they got this much. And there's a, a double double dipping there. Then there's some. I, I don't know what happens after that, but uh, I think that's fraud. And then, is the city or the borough? Let's just say the city, because we're talking to you. Is it uh, liable for that? for that fraud or is that individual liable for the fraud? Individual is liable. Go ahead. Hi, this is Margarita. Um, the individual is liable. This is, um, this is Mayor Matherly. We wanted the, <clears throat> Mindy, we, we wanted the online application to be as thorough as possible. Much like, in, and Bart would know from banking days, we wanted the information to be provided as much as we could from the individual with reassurances on things. I, I anticipate, you know, some double dipping or trying to get away with it. But if you have a statement where somebody signs, it puts a little more emphasis on their truthfulness. And that's kind of what we're shooting for with the online thing, because we want to get the money out quick to the citizens and, and the better, our, the better off we'll be if we have a very thorough application to identify how they qualify and to avoid some of the, the fraudulent things that might happen. Mistakes could happen too, but if we share that with the borough, 
and they look at it, then I think it could, it could help eliminate those problems. Yeah, we plan on putting a spreadsheet together and it appears based on timelines, we might be uh, in front of the borough. So as we award, we'll put a spreadsheet together and send it over to the borough and said, we just awarded company ABC with 100,000 with these expenses. Um, so I, I, I think we'll do due diligence to the best we can, but if you want to cheat the system and you're hell bound to do it, you will probably uh, do it, uh, but I think you might get caught later on. I think a bigger concern or a more likely concern is that there would be some lag time in between different applications coming through and somebody may, you know, get um, a pot of money from the city and have already applied for the borough at that time, they haven't actually gotten it. I could just see that there could be some confusion there. Um, is that is that list going to be made public as well, the list of organizations? I don't expect the list of individuals, but businesses or nonprofits that receive those public funds, will, will those be public? Well, it would be uh, uh, open records request. Uh, we would have to fill that request, but we weren't thinking about doing a newspaper article. But I guess in theory, uh, uh, you could have a, a, a media outlet ask for the list under the public records. We would give it to them and they could publish it in the paper. So it's not, it's not a super secret. We just weren't going to you know, announce it publicly unless asked. Thanks. Thanks for your work on that. Is that something the borough has considered also, Mayor Ward or, or Ms. Smart? Yeah, Joe, well, this is Mayor Ward. Um, so a, a couple questions there. I think the first one um, to answer is that uh, if a business does apply for funding and receives funding, uh, is their information subject to public disclosure? And the answer is yes. Uh, personal identif identification uh, numbers, social security numbers, things like that would not be um, subject to, but uh, your business name, your business location, contact information um, would be subject to those to those public request, um, public disclosure request. Uh, as far as listing the, the businesses, again, that, that would also be something that would be listed uh, or be subject to a, a records request. Uh, we did have discussion about um, identifying the locations or um, where those businesses were. And I think we had settled on just uh, at this point, we would just do a general number as part of our dashboard of how many businesses have applied, how many have received funding and the total of that funding. Um, but that we wouldn't necessarily be publishing the, the backup or minutia details um, or data of, of who those businesses were and how much they applied um, or received. Um, I, I think the other question too on um, how we are looking at ensuring that there's not the, the double dipping or that folks are not getting funding between both the city and the borough that, that are above and beyond what their need is. Um, it, that definitely is gonna require uh, communication between the city of Fairbanks and the Fairbanks North Star Borough. I think the biggest issue, and Ms. O'Neill mentioned this, is not necessarily folks trying to game the system, but if they apply to multiple agencies for relief and then they receive um, more than what their need is, how do we balance that? And so um, part of that work is gonna be done by our third party consultant um, to work with folks when they apply to for these, these programs to make sure that they understand um, that they, they are only eligible to receive the amount of what the, the need is. So uh, that it, it, they can't claim those expenses or those losses more than once. So that's, that's part of the reason why we want to bring on a third party um, contractor to market and to work with uh, those organizations as they apply. But then I imagine as part of this process that we were still um, fleshing out the, the final details of how we would um, internally process and then actually issue the checks, that there would be another check to make sure that uh, another check and balance to make sure that the entity hadn't received funding between the application period and when the check was actually issued uh, from from the Fairbanks North Star Borough. Thank you, Jomo. Hey, Jomo. Uh, to add, yes, Mr. Mayor. To add to what uh, Mayor Ward just said, I know I've talked to some business owners that are working with their their accountants and their uh, their accountants they have for their business to make sure that they don't uh, 
make any errors to. That won't be for everybody, but that's just another layer uh, that some business owners are taking. They're working with their accountants on every application and hopefully that could be an extra set of eyes and eyes on, on so that there's no double dipping or accidental, uh, accidental double dipping. So I just wanted to add that thought. It sounds like maybe one of the greater risks is that funds would get tied up. If, if a business put in multiple applications and was approved, but was then in a position to choose which one they would take, it might tie up uh, some of the funds. Well, it would tie up the funds that they weren't going to take, at least for a short period of time. Well, and also, if we are live with our application July 1, if any whether the borough was live first and we were live first, that would help a little bit because we want to get through the application fairly quickly. And if we provide reports to Mayor Ward during the month of July, I think that would help if they're not totally live by then. So if we started on the exact same date with the exact same things, I could see that being a little confusing, but if one starts before the other, I think that would help. Joe, well, this is uh, Mayor Ward. Uh, we're, we're anticipating that, that our program won't be up and running until August 1st. Oh, so that should leave time to, to again, kind of work through the city, city funding. Certainly. Yeah, Joe, this is Mike. It, it looks like uh, if everything works out the way we just been uh, briefed, uh, the checks would go out to our businesses by the end before the borough would start. That would work everywhere except individuals. The individuals, I think, is going to be our most challenging. Uh, but the borough doesn't have that type of program, it seemed like. Uh, so I think as far as businesses and uh, nonprofits and medical facilities, I don't think that uh, we'll, we'll trip on each other. Certainly, we in the public, uh, I think I can speak for the public in this. You know, we, we appreciate you working through this challenge very much. Okay. Joe, well, All right. well, I'm looking. Oh, yes, please. If, if I could add one thing, um, one of the challenges that we definitely face, and we're going to have to work with um, uh, the, the contractor that we bring on board for this, is the, the sheer volume uh, of, of applications. Um, so if we look at the $10 million pot uh, that we have allocated for the business interruption grant, and then you assume that you're awarding $15,000 to every applicant, um, that's 667 um, applications uh, that would need to be processed in order to, to get that funding out. So what, I mean, I, one of the things I definitely want to make sure that the community understands is uh, if we get all 600 applications in the same day, it's going to take us a period of time to process those um, even if you assumed it was an hour per application or a half hour per application, um, you're still 300 and some hours, which is basically a, a whole month of one person devoted solely to doing that with no bathroom breaks. So, uh, and that's just one program that we have, just as the city of Fairbanks has several programs. So um, there will be, I think, a little bit of a bottleneck depending on how fast people apply for the application or how many, how many people apply and how quickly they apply to these programs um, that, uh, that the community needs to be aware of. And also, also we anticipate when we talked about this in our meeting that we're just gonna take a, a huge amount of calls, just information calls from people. What about this? What about that? We have a, a team ready with the city and someone that we're bringing on, but we're going to get a lot of calls, maybe not into, maybe not from businesses, maybe, but I think individuals will take the majority of those phone calls. So that's uh, going to add to the workload a little bit. And, and there's uh, another thing that we've looked at, because we're on first come, first serve basis, a uh, lesson learned from people uh, on this program was that you'd have some people submit an application real quick and uh, it was not complete and then the uh, banking institutions had to keep going back and getting more and more information. So we're looking at our first, uh, 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 we're looking at our queue not starting until the application is complete 
and been approved by the bank, now you're in line uh, first come, first serve. And we think that might stop anyone who's game playing and just submit something real quick uh, so you can maintain your position. Uh, and so we're working with that on our process flow chart. Where would that queuing uh, be? And I think that's important for anyone who tries to game that system that way. And it would be less back and forth between banks and uh, us calling, hey, we need this, we need that. Put it on the individual who's seeking the money to get your application complete and all the, all the receipts that uh, expenses uh, in there. And then once we have that and it's all right, that's where you are in the queue. It appears we have a question from Ms. Hollowell. Uh, yeah, so I have a question in regards to our customers here for IGU and being able to, um, any of those that were impacted, so they have not been able to pay their bills. Um, how would that program work for those individuals to be able to apply? Is it something that you would need them to provide their bill that they haven't paid us to provide can we start promoting the program to our customers once uh, uh this is mike once we have uh love inc sign the contract uh we will be able to put that out and you can also uh, help us with any of that advertisement but once again if uh if they have legitimate expense as it became uh, to gas that they haven't paid and it's covid related uh, it wouldn't go to them it would go to you we would we'd go straight to the utility company uh, uh and we would pay that uh that money uh, for them uh, and it would be a credit uh, to them and that way we don't have to worry about money going to individuals that, and they don't put it toward where it where it needed to go does that make sense it does, thank you. And if we can promote it, then that can be something that I would love to add to our website to give customers that ability to find that kind of assistance. If you could, uh, would you send me an email, kind of let me know what the total uh, number uh, dollars is in arrears? Uh, I'd be just curious. With Golden Heart only being 300000 uh, I would guess Golden Valley is probably close to the same. I'd be just curious what uh, we're looking at dollar-wise. Absolutely. Thank I you. I that email. Okay. Do we have anyone online from North Pole? It looks like we have about five minutes left. Okay, I don't see anyone raising their hand. Um, just so we know, I did go to their website. Uh, so again, at this juncture, it looks like uh, I, we, Jim and I did have a conversation with Mayor Welsh uh, last week um, regarding their, their possible plan for distribution. Uh, I'll simply say that it, it seemed similar uh, to both what the city and the borough were doing and that it, it was uh, envisioning different pots of money um, you know, some some funding set aside for businesses in North Pole, some for medical, uh, uh, along those same lines. It looks like at this point they have uh, they had worked on an ordinance simply accepting the funds, uh, but I see that it is up for reconsideration on their calendar for this evening. So we may provide a uh, circle back around with more information when when they've actually acted and and uh, do publish their plan. Jim, I was at their last council meeting. Would you like me to give a brief summary? Oh, sir, please. Thank you. Yeah, so the North Pole City Council had a uh, resolution before them, not today, but last Monday, uh, to accept the CARES Act funding. They didn't um, meet the quorum, or they had quorum, but they didn't meet their um, majority vote. They needed four votes in order to do that. Uh, and they, they only had five members present, two, two voted against it. So there was a reconsideration last week uh, by one of their council members to accept the funding. Uh, that's, that's simply what this resolution does. They have yet to appropriate um, the funding sources. I know we've been in communication, I've been in communication with Mayor Welch on partnering um, through the, the boroughs program where we could either uh, take applications for them, process them, and then 
essentially send those packets over to the city for them to, to be able to actually issue the checks or go through another committee if they wish. Um, or um, they, if they were interested that they could make their allocation to the borough and we would just simply add it to the pots that we have um, for funding. So that, that has yet to be determined by their council, um, but we have been having those conversations on how we can partner and work together uh, to get that funding out to, to North Pole folks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Well, again, right now, I, I, uh, we're nearing the end of our time. However, we do have a few minutes left. Are there any further questions or, or um, Mr. Mayors, any final comments? I just want to thank the, in, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to thank uh, the team at the borough and the team at the city that we put together for this money, I would li I'd like to also thank Fedco for, for hosting this and for the interior delegation and everybody listening. This has been a year like no other year. I'm, I'm hoping that we don't enter into a similar situation this fall. The positives, the positive cases are leaving me just a little bit leery. I know there's increased testing going on too, but we just don't know what to expect. and. We've got our work cut out for us at the city when it comes to just the overall economic impact. <clears throat> so my budget year is going to be really challenging. And I know that the interior delegation in Juno is facing the same. So I'd like to thank everybody on this line for all the hard work that you're doing. Elected or not, we all have to, we've all been working as a team, the, the best of our ability. And I know at the city, we've never, you know, we distribute bed tax funds every year, but we've never done anything like this. And I think it's also a new ground for the borough. So I want to thank Mayor Ward and his team. And also, I'm really proud of the team here at the city and the group we put together to be as meaningful as we can with this money distribution. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor Matherly. Oh, I can if I could provide a few comments too, I, I think um, it's it's important definitely to recognize that uh, the CARES Act funding that's coming in through the cities or the borough um, will have a, a, an impact on the community. I think this has the, the ability to help uh, a lot of those struggling businesses. Um, the intent is that, that we keep these businesses operating uh, within our community, that they are able to be successful and, and thriving in the future. I, I think the challenge that we face is if you look at the overall losses um, that we've seen so far with the pandemic, um, this is a drop in the bucket. And so we have a long ways to go to get us back to where we were pre-COVID. Um, this isn't gonna be a, a, something that solves the problem. It's gonna, it's gonna help. It's definitely a good thing um, to be able to provide that assistance, but we have a lot of work left to do as a community to get ourselves back to where we were um, just a few short months ago. So. I would encourage folks to, um, to review the recovery plan that we put together with the borough uh, and the Economic Development Commission, uh, and, and then really to look at how we can position ourselves to, um, to really be better and get back to where we were, because um, we've, we've got a lot of ground to, to cover um, that we've lost in the last few months. So I don't mean to say that to be a downer, but um, I, I do want folks to know that, that we've got a lot of work that we've got to do. And I'm, I'm very interested in working with uh, Mayor Matherly, Mayor Welch, other community leaders on how we can get our, our community um, back to where we were and then, ex and, and then uh, thriving and going beyond that. So uh, we've got a bright future, but it's gonna take some, it's gonna take some elbow grease. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, that, and again, that was an excellent reality check. Uh, we have a long ways to go. Uh, but again, it, it gives me some uh, some hope and comfort uh, that, that we have such good people working so hard on this and so diligently. Uh, so a bit of thanks uh, both to our municipal leaders and staffs for their hard work, also to our legislators and their staffs for their hard work, uh, helping make these funds available for our community and our economy. Well, all right, everybody, thank you very much for an excellent presentation and a good discussion. Uh, just a little note on next week. It appears that we will be returning uh, to energy a bit uh, with a presentation, an update presentation from the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. All right. 
Well, with nothing further to discuss, thanks everybody for uh, tuning in, and we will hear you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jomo.